This is Come to Daddy with Ruben Kay, the podcast about parents that asks who's really to blame for the psychological problems of our celebrity guests. This is going to be fun. I'm not saying I have daddy issues, but I do get an erection every time I walk past a Papa John's. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to another episode of Come to Daddy, the podcast about our parents, hosted by me, Reuben Kay. Dear listener, I would like to take you on a journey, if I may, a journey into the deep recesses of the unconscious. Where on the emotional compass will we land? So join us as we explore the north, south, east, and rose west of parenting. <laughs> so why am I talking to my guests about their mums and dads? Well, because it's the origin story, the root of it all, the genetic code. We all know our parents fuck us up, but what else do they give us? Do they give us strength, resilience, a sense of humour? I know someone gave me a nose so strong it could be used as a ship's rudder. Who's to blame? So stand by for heartwarming moments, funny stories, poignant realisations, and for getting to know how and why my guests turned out the way they did. Thankfully, I've got someone to help me through this. I'm ably assisted, some would say guided even, by my very own nurse Ratchet, sans nurse's uniform, even though I know she's got it hanging up in her closet, my amazing producer, Amanda Sangorski. How are you doing, Amanda? Hello. Anyway, listen as we march down memory lane, looking for signposts in the dark undergrowth of the adult human psyche. Now, it's not just my celebrity guests I want to hear from, because my daddy that's what I'm calling you, you are all my children now, and I've got nipples for everyone. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, <laughs> hang on, hang on. I know you didn't let me get a word in edgeways earlier, but my job is to basically make sure that nipple, <laughs> cock... I know what you're like, and if if left to your own devices, that would be every this this would just be called cop. But it's this, a, this podcast. It's a democracy. It's nipples for everybody. I'm I'm a I'm a giver. We um we need to uh, let's just ease into it. And I know that you've heard that before, but let's just that'll it'll come out naturally in the chat. Ironically, sort of. the last time I heard that was Father's Day. See, here we go. So share with us any of your funny stories or even better, fully corroborated accusations about your upbringing. But please have witnesses. And let's turn this echo chamber into a duet. You can also please feel free to send in a copy of your bank details, the deed to your house and your blood type. It's all necessary to get full lifelong membership of the Come to Daddy Club. The spelling for that I'll leave up to you, Amanda. I think people know how I would like it spelled. Please send us an email at cometodaddypodcast at gmail.com. So professional. Combining the floppy hair and the boyish face of Justin Bieber at the start of his career with the filthy mind and irresponsible behaviour of Justin Bieber at the Anne Frank Museum, today's guest is a comedian whose career spans putting on Beanie Baby shows with their brother to being named Newcomer of the Year at the 2019 Chortle Awards and having their own Amazon Prime special, Dark Horse. Their Radio 4 series, Are You a Boy or a Girl?, explores gender fluidity and some may say to top it all, they also won Celebrity Coach Trip. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for someone who says their parents spent their first five years dressing them as a Victoria sponge. Come to daddy, Sarah Keyworth. Hello. Oh, that was lovely. Was it? Was it a good one? Yeah, I forgot all that stuff, so it's nice to catch up. Do you know, because this is obviously one of my first times doing a, a podcast and even better mm. being able to do intros for people. It's so much fun doing them, but I go... Is it right? Am I doing it right? I organised a panel once, like a sort of, it was like a talk uh, about... A specific subject and I wrote all the bios for it. I was like in uni university mm. and I booked it they basically just handed it to me and were like you do it and I was like I'm just on work experience I don't know why you've done this to me and I, I wrote all the bios for these guest speakers and every single one was so wrong <laughs> and every speaker was like I'm not sure I particularly agree with the way you've introduced me and I was like I thought somebody would check this would proofread it I'm 18 years old <laughs> and I don't know shit what so, fetus wrote this introduction yeah, I kind 
kind of did it as a collection of notes and handed it over and then the host just read it out as I sent it and I was like oh we should have had a conversation about this all right where do we start with this Victoria sponge jam in the middle tell me all uh so I I was a baby um <laughs> good place to start yeah is that what you want yeah, you go, yeah that's um, the content we crave as it, it, you know we, when we're talking about my parents we can't not mention the fact that I was a baby, um, their baby specifically. And um, yeah, I was, I always say this, I think I was the first girl, mm-hmm. uh, girl in, uh, in, in air Parentheses, quotes. air quotes uh, being made for um, those who can't see in this um, audio medium. Yes, I was the first uh, person with a vagina born into the Keyworth family for, uh, I think, it was about 40 years. What? Because there was... Were you living under power lines all those times? I don't know what happened. There was just so many boys. How did that mean you were treated? Well, I think they were just like very excited to have a girl. So everybody just dresses and tiaras. And I had a little pair of plastic high heels. Like just before I, <laughs> before I could walk, I had a pair of heels. A little princess costume. Um, so I was very sort of... Um, My dad tried to make me play rugby. Did, really? Do you and I... Should you and I have switched? We should have switched, yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's hard for my dad to want me to be masculine mm-hmm. when I look like Barbara Cartland if she was bitten <laughs> by a radioactive <laughs> faggot. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The only time we clicked was when he realised that I was watching the rugby for the slow motion replay. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. Was when yeah. he just went... Oh, the penny has indeed dropped. Yeah, he's suddenly like, stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> How did you react when they started kind of dolling you up, I guess? Well, I, I, the moment I was able to communicate that I didn't want that to happen, I did communicate that. But there's a picture of me as a baby. I, I always thought that I looked like a bloke in a dress. There's a picture of me as, as a baby and I'm wearing this big blue dress. I look like Phil Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> like I look like a full on geezer. I'll send it to you. I've n- I look so aggressive. Like I should have a pi- <laughs> like a pint in my hand. No, there there is absolutely nothing more, as you say, aggressive than a butch in a dress. Yeah, than a bold baby with like the, my rolls looked like muscle. I look I look like I could knock you out. <laughs> I'll send you the photo. Please do. Very strong. So this is my parental questionnaire. I ask the same questions of all of the guests on Come to Daddy. Quick fire answers. It's technically a speed round, but I don't have the budget for a clock or a ticking sound effect yet. Okay. But one day. I'm excited. Not, Imagine if you just, <laughs> this was a, you did a podcast where you just told people they were adopted. <laughs> That's my dream. That's Because quite frankly, I'm going to be honest, Sarah, we have had too many queer comedians on this podcast with loving supportive family who don't have any trauma for me to mine for likes comments or any kind of traction and there seems to be a disappointing and quite frankly tragic trend of well-adjusted queer people going into comedy i'm gonna have to rewrite my history for you there then on the on the lamb you better my father was a brute (laughs) how about that uh, my what? mother never loved me. <laughs> All right, questionnaire. Names of parents? Uh, Francis and Carolyn. Which one is which? Uh, Francis is my dad. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, how old it's are very th- gender fluid. <laughs> it is, it's yeah. nice. They're Fran and Carrie. I just wanted to give you their full names. Fran and Carrie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's camp. Yeah, I love it. A little double act. That's gorge. Yeah. Where do they live? Uh, Nottingham. What are their ages? Um, my... Dad will be 72 tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday, Francis. Yeah, and my mum is 70 next year. Great. Oh, that's a big one. Mm, yeah. When was the last time you spoke to them? Uh, it would have been last week. We, went, we all went to Norfolk together a couple of weeks ago for my mum's birthday. Oh, so, that's nice. Uh, but, yeah, it, I would have talked to them on the phone, mm. probably about some bollocks. <laughs> Are they still together? We'll probably text about Nottingham Forest. That's... Yeah, embarrassing. What happens in Nottingham Forest? Um, uh, Nottingham Forest, the it's football, a football team. team. It's a football. This, that's yeah. the most uh, lesbian, uh, queer <laughs> man exchange that's ever happened. <laughs> what happened? Your ears perked up, and you were like, "What goes on in the forest? <laughs> what do the men do in the forest?" <laughs> the little cottaging signs appeared in your eyes. Absolutely, um, they did. Vacant uh, and engaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's sports. I'm so sorry. Mm, dear. It's Nottingham Forest. Is but a, look at us breaking down boundaries. I know. Educational. 
Um, and now finally, uh, this is a very quick one, and we're looking for a percentage here. How much do you blame them for how you turned out? Uh, Three, two, one. Seventy percent. Oh. I think that's I think that's wrong. Maybe more. That's nice. I have to take some responsibility for the fuck that I am. So just I would love to get a picture of the Keyworth household. Mm. Like I grew up in the 90s as well. What's little Sarah doing? I was never very good at sort of uh, entertaining myself. I have an older brother, so it'd be like whatever he was doing, I'm mm. just bothering him with that. Like play. And then like, I don't know, 15 minutes in, he's been mean, I'm crying. We're both shouting, Mom, and everything's chaos. Me and my brother weren't allowed in the same room together. No, we never. To be, so we had to be separated all the time because no. it would be vicious fights. The only time we got together and worked together was when we would put on shows in the living room for all of the, the deaths in opera. Oh, no, I thought you were going to say in the family. No. Uh, <laughs> just, that seems very well, distasteful. Well, the death of my father's and my mother's hope for grandchildren, <laughs> for both of us, maybe. Ooh, we I would see. do the ends of opera, so the final act of Tosca, with mm. my brother as Don Jose and me as Carmen, where my brother would get to stab me, and I'd have a Ribena pouch of blood. Will you revive this? I love this. It's on at the Soho Theatre downstairs. No. <laughs> <laughs> they won't let us have the big room for it. <laughs> what did you try and play with your brother at? Um, any Lego, PlayStation, Beanie Babies. Well, now, I've only just discovered through the glory of Amanda mm. what a Beanie Baby is. Ah, okay. Can you elaborate what these shows, because this feels a bit theatrical for someone who loves guns. Oh, no. It wasn't. It was like a sketch show. It was a bit like SNL for Beanie oh, Baby. Right. Live on a Saturday afternoon. It's uh, the Prickles with Tickles show. That's what it was called. I'm sorry, what? So there was a Beanie Baby that was a hedgehog called Prickles. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had tickles. And what, a, as in, is that a condition? I don't know. I guess it's. A, it was a rhyme. You have to be led by the rhyme. Yeah, it's the Andrew Lloyd Webber Tim Rice paradox. Abs absolutely, it doesn't have to make sense; it just has to rhyme. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and she would host this sketch show, and there'd be a range of different animals. And what it. was your involvement in that? Oh, I was the audience. <laughs> I watched. And how the tables are I watched turned. The show. Yeah. Do you remember? And this is a vendetta against my brother. <laughs> my entire career. After every show, I leave like that. <laughs> and did your parents watch these? Beanie Baby shows as well? Oh no. 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 No, this is that that was what they they encouraged us to do so that they could they were probably just drinking wine in the other room. Oh see that's goals. Yeah. No, they were very um good at being parents. In that like they sort of uh they hacked being parents in a good they had two they were both in their forties, they had two children, those children entertained each other and they just drank some wine. Amazing. It was incredible. And you didn't do any like you didn't have that that urge to do shows for your parents. I did shows with my friends and stuff. I, not not my, my brother would never get involved with mm. the, sh the with the shows I wanted to do. But me and my my friend who lived next door to me, Alex, we would uh, we would put on shows. We'd dance to S Club Seven. Amazing. Um, there was a brief time when I was forced to take uh, dance lessons, like ballet, tap, and jazz. There was a woman called Tracy Quaif <gasps> who ran the. Uh, who is naming? Who is naming? Children's dance teachers, Tracy Quaife versus my one, Rennie Ann Martini. <gasps> They're just drag queens, aren't they? Absolutely. They're and this queens. is why we are what we are now. But Tracy Quaife was just a normal lady. She was just a normal woman. She was just wearing like a like a track suit. She wasn't And what was what was your I I'm not gonna this is gonna sound cruel when I say it, but know that it's said with love. Mm, no, I know. I know what you're gonna say. What was your aptitude like when it comes to ballet, jazz and or tap? Listen, you're asking in it a tone where I know you know the answer. <laughs> so I don't know why we're doing why were you putting me through this? I I am not a ballet dancer now, obviously. I tripped in my way into this room. <laughs> I'm not sat here with any kind of grace. That's true. That is true. I didn't she do did. any. I, I don't. I don't do tap or jazz. We had to send two I couldn't Ubers tie for my you ballet today. shoes. I cried every week. They sent me home early. That's what no. happened. Yeah. Because I was. I was like, I don't. They put you in a little skirt and I'd be fuming, and then and then everyone would be like, Why well, you can't you tie your shoes? And I'd be like, Leave me alone. 
<laughs> Going on to your parents, your parents have been married for over 40 years mm. and you've got this great routine where you talk about how they've made it last so long. How have your parents made it work for 40 years? Um, well, partly I think, I, I genuinely think them having us so late. So like my parents were married for about 20 years before they had children. Wow. They got married in their early 20s. And then I think they had my brother when my dad was 40 and my mum was 38. So they had like a, f like a long life of fun where they went to like, they went to Glastonbury, they go on holiday all the time with their mates. They were just like enjoying themselves. And then they had kids. And I think, my, it's, this sounds so fucking lame and cliche. They make each other laugh so much. And now that they're in their 70s, they bicker all of the time. They're like that stereotype of like, you know, roll dial the twits. <laughs> like Absolutely. That sort of vibe. They're constantly like bickering and my dad's sort of losing his hearing and my mum's <laughs> winding him up about stuff. The, I went home last year and my dad was like, as your mother told you what her new, uh, for, like, her new form of fun is. And I was like, what? And my mum had started doing this thing where uh, at night... She'd race my dad to bed so that she got in bed first so that he would have to turn off the light. And then when he had to come into the bedroom and turn off the light and then walk to the bed in the dark, she'd nick his pillows so that when he gets into bed and puts his head down, he's, he's just banging his head on the headboard. And then she'd cackle for ages. She'd laugh. He'd get up after get out of bed, turn the lights on. She'd go, really sorry, put his pillows back. And they both know that when he turns off the light and tries to walk back to the bed, she's going to do it again. And she just won't let him sleep. And that's how you keep a man, I think. <laughs> Through you, gaslighting and low-level yeah, torture. you keep him in a constant state of confusion. It's very funny, though. That's great. It does make me laugh. That does sound like a lovely, a lovely relationship where the teasing and, dare I say, bullying is mm. taken in stride. Never stop pranking each other. I think that's... <laughs> you say your mum is one of the strongest people you've ever met? Yeah. She's amazing. Give me... Can you have an example? She's just... My mum's family have been through so much in their lives and mm. my mum is just so fun. All of the, And, like, if she wasn't fun, you'd be like, fair play. Mm. You you have the right to kind of be a bit down on things. But she's so great. It's very interesting. I think people who've been through a lot sometimes can go one of two ways. They can either take what they've been through with a sense of perspective mm. and which means that they sort of become quite incredibly chill yeah. about stuff. And quite well adjusted because they go, well, you know, it's not as bad as this. Or they go the other way and everything's a drama. Yeah. No, she's so, she's one of those people where she just, no, my mum's my father passed away when she was 18 years old. She was talking about this the other day and she said that she remember she, like, she went to school the next day because that's just mm. what they did. Like, the, and, and she doesn't really remember any kind of processing of that happening. It just happened. Wow. And she was 18 and you just got on with it. And that and that was that was that for her, and I just think to, to and it's not even impacted my life in any way. It's not like I'm learning about that now and kind of going well. Like now, as an adult who is sort of a, a, able to acknowledge the trauma of what it must be like to lose a parent so young, mm. I can appreciate that. But my whole, like, you know, was that was not a, not a shadow on my childhood that was not something you know oh well you know you've got to sort of think about your mother because her father died or and things like that yeah. and that was not a thing my mom is so incredible and my grandmother was a refugee during the war so she had this this kind of grew up in this backdrop of like my both my grandparents were german refugees they they moved they were both jewish so they moved over and so they had gone through horrible trauma yeah experienced awful things not being welcome in the country that they were born in and that was just that's never ever touched me god that's, that's never so touched funny, my, life. my parents are german and russian refugees yeah. from the second world war from berlin and it's so apparent in their lives yeah. and so apparent in my upbringing mm -hmm. we were raised with it like immersed in it all yeah that's so fascinating that it i can't even imagine what it must be like to kind of discover that stuff later on and not be suffused with it well i was talked to about it when i was sort of like studying oh, the okay. war at school and things like that and people sit down and go oh, well you know your, your grandmother experienced this and i was shown her identity card and things like that mm. and we talked about it and stuff but it was never a sort of it's not an inherited trauma 
um, which I just think is is kind of unbelievable. I guess when I listen to or discover more about my parents as adults, a lot of their behaviour suddenly can't be. I see I see a lot of their behaviour in an absolutely new light, mm. and kind of go, oh well, that explains this. Yeah. Have elements of that happened to you with your parents? Yeah, and I get to tell you a story, and every time I tell it, I also I, I'm very emotional all the time, so this is nothing special, okay? I'll just flag that. But every time I tell this story, it makes me a bit emotional, so I'll tell it to you now. When I was a teenager, I'd get so mad um, because if I went out into town or whatever, like, and so this is like 16, 17, 18, I would go into town and I'd get the bus back with my friends and my dad would be stood at the bus stop waiting to walk me home. And I'd be mortified. I'd be so annoyed. I'd be like, everybody else's parents, just let them walk home by their self. This is so embarrassing. I'm perfectly capable of walking five minutes up the road. Why? And, and it, it, my mum had sent my dad down to the bus stop to meet me. And I was talking to my mum about this and she was saying, yeah, I mean, I remember being a teenager and coming back from town with my friends. And my mum's got a very close friend called Sally. And they'd get off the bus... Um, and Sally's dad would be waiting for her and my mum's dad didn't mm. do that and she would run home on her own with her keys in her hand and I realised at the age of 28, 29 that that thing that used to drive me mad was just my mum doing for me what she didn't have when she was a teenager and I think that's really fucked up mm that she made me feel that way. <laughs> I hate how cute that story is. <laughs> it is yeah. adorable and it's yeah. it's so common that we want our independence, we don't want to be cared for yeah. as kids, but it's parents being like, this is really fucking important. I'm so sorry that I've come here and been like, I was so loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was so loved. It's really problematic actually. <laughs> but Such wonderful parents. <laughs> yeah. Um, who are you most like out of Fran and Carrie? Um, mm. I think I'm very similar to my dad and I feel like I'm getting more and more similar to my dad as I get all like both my parents are very funny, but my, a lot of my style of my sense of humour is, is, I think is, comes from my dad. My dad is, is very, very funny and also will not hesitate to make a pun at, or at, like, like a classic dad joke, but at any opportunity. I love that we refer to them as like the twits, but they seem like a really benign version. Oh of... yeah, like they're, like they're not angry twits. They're yeah. just sort of fun bickering. Twi- like like there is a war raging. But it it's... feels like they should have their own sort of TikTok <laughs> yeah. or Instagram channel. Like Absolutely. we live in the same house. We keep playing pranks on each other. If they could do that, and if they could work a phone, then I think they'd be amazing. I mean, we could monetize it and make a pain off it. Absolutely. How have, so? You've had, I mean, every queer child has a journey right with their parents to use an mm. overused phrase journey how have they been uh, you've had a couple of stages obviously yeah how have they been at each stage of that journey they don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie they've seen you um so i was terrified of coming out when i was a teenager which is so ridiculous given everything i've just told you about mm. i think maybe i i hoped it would sort of sort itself out you know, mm. like it would sort of get bored and, and, and go away if I if I waited it out. Yeah. If I, if I ignored it for long enough, then it would, uh, then I wouldn't. You or know, maybe I'd, if you get to one where I don't need to come out, I don't need to say anything, yeah. but then it bubbles up inside of you. Yeah. I um, I think I had I had a girlfriend who who was who'd come out to her mom and was like, "Why not? Like, mm. then I can come over to your house." Mm. and be your girlfriend and I was sort of like yeah that's just how nice um and so I but I told my mum I I, a lot of us do this where you go I'm I think I like girls I don't I'm not necessarily saying yeah I don't like boys (laughs) the door is ajar I I mean I think at that point I just never had a boyfriend again (laughs) So they're probably still waiting. Yeah, you know? I'm drawing the outline. Sarah you said have to she's in the... bi. Yeah. <laughs> she's bi. She said she's bi. She hasn't said anything else. So. Yeah. You draw the outline. They have to colour in the rainbow. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, um, then, and then the non-binary discussion was after that? I've never really 
had a discussion with them about being non-binary. Oh, that's interesting. Um, that's something that I... Now's the time. They're here. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'd love that. <laughs> That'd be so nice. Um, although I've never... It's never... That's a conversation that I've never felt like I've had to have with them. That's lovely. Um, and then they come to see me do stand-up and they've always known that I've had, um, like... Because you're open I, about yeah. it in your stand-up. Yeah, and I never... I think that they've been... They've been we're very close. We've been mm. hanging out the whole time. I've never had to sit them down and go, I'm not... I'm not female. I feel as though my parents see me for who I am. Um, and sometimes they say things that are just so cute. Like... During the pandemic, I mentioned to my mum, I was like thinking, I was like, should I just get a job? Should I just do any old job just to like get out of the house or whatever? And I was like, I'd love to be like a like a food delivery driver, but I think you do need like a big strong man to do that. And my mum was like, you are a big strong man. <laughs> and I was like, mum, oh, oh that stop is, it. That is fucking revolting. Yeah, I know. And beautiful. Yeah. And then sometimes they'll, sometimes they say things like my mum, will say things about me and my girlfriend where she'll be like, oh, me and the girls or whatever. But like, it kind of, I, t- I take that with the positives as well. Where yeah. I'm like, I'd never turn around to my, mo- to my mum and go, what the fuck are you talking about? Because like, I know that she knows who she I knows. am. Yeah. That's really, that's really beautiful. There's no trauma here, is there? No, but it's actually, no. can I say, why aren't we telling beautiful, happy queer yeah. stories as well? Do you think... I mean, I think I know the answer to this question, but I still like to ask, do you feel that they're proud of you? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. That's good. Um, I think they're very proud of me. Um, I think my dad isn't very good at like um, voicing like emotional things. Mm. Like he won't, he's he's not necessarily, he's not really soppy. Um, But I can sort of see it. It, like if he comes to a show or anything like that, he um, he'll he'll he'll, he'll, he'll say, yeah, that was slick. <laughs> it's was, was very slick. The lighting was great. <laughs> God, you really said all those words, Your didn't hair you? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and they'll do the same. God, that was slick. That was a that was that was that. Yeah, that was a thing. And you have to learn to not take that as a negative, mm. being like, oh, you didn't think I was any good, or you were ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. And you go, no, I think you genuinely thought that was slick, and that impresses you. Yeah. Whereas my mum, um, when I entered a, a comedy competition as a very new stand-up mm. and I came second, uh, broke her knuckle during a celebration. <laughs> On what? On, On a, the person who came first she, face? It was a... <laughs> can you imagine? Uh, it was at King's Place in London. It was called the Funny Women Final. And um, she, she was up on a balcony and there was a metal bar balcony thing in front of her and she went yes and and smacked her knuckle um and then she had this massive bruise so yeah i think she's proud of me that's i mean (laughs) yeah she's two knuckles deep proud of Uh, you that's not the phrase i'm ever i retract it in the context of my mother (laughs) (laughs) thanks leave that in i want everyone to know who you are (laughs) (laughs) i'm kind i'm loving (laughs) All right, let's take a little break from the chat and move on to one of my favorite parts of Come to Daddy, which is the Come to Daddy Pick and Mix. Is your relationship with your parents sweet or does it leave a sour taste in your mouth? Don't worry, we've got mouthwash, sponsored by my oral thrush. I wish that was a joke. I'm in agony. And you've picked parental advisory. Parents are a font of wisdom. In my own mother's words, dull women have immaculate homes. Words of advice I have taken to this day. That's true. Has Fran or Carrie given you any bon mots to steer you through life? When I was a child, this is this is a Fran pearl of wisdom, mm. and I st- I mean it. I still think about this to this. I use this to this day. Great. <laughs> um, when I was a child, I had a really difficult time uh, wiping my own ass. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and and like doing a good job. Look, some it. people still struggle to this day. It's really challenging. Like, well, how do you get the how how do you get the technique down? Mm. And then sometimes I'd be like up at night with a sore bum, 
feeling very distressed mm-hmm. and I'd have to be like taken out of bed and given a little bath or whatever. What, what age is this again? Like, uh, like 23, 24. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, but like, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And my mum was saying to me like, just, you know, you just need to make sure that you're wiping your bum properly. Mm. And I was going, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I remember my dad sitting me down and going, the thing about, wiping your bums Sarah is that is that what I do is you wipe no and then you have a look at it and and wipe to the point where you're not getting anything off the tissue anymore so if the tissue is clear then you can stop that's you know what I that's the advice I use now yeah is that has that changed your life? That changed my life. I hope we're changing lives of the, the listeners. The last three years have been a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> we have reached the end of today, tonight, this afternoon, this morning's episode of Come to Daddy with Sarah Keyworth, but. We have one final challenge, one final gauntlet, Mm. one final baptism of fire. If I believed in baptism, which as we know is just waterboarding for Jesus. And it's called, Shall I Be Mother? Shall I Be Mother? Sarah, this is where you get to stare into my beautiful, soulful, emotional eyes and pretend that I am your mother, your father, or both whichever one is more uncomfortable, and speak directly from the heart, what would you say to me? Wait, wait which, which one are you? You can do, <laughs> Even I don't know. Yeah. Or, yeah. It's up to you. So let's go with my dad. Mm. That might be more... Because we'd never do this. My father and... My mum and I tell each other nice things all the time, but my, my dad... Um, I think I'd say to my dad that I'm really grateful for the kind of man that he is, in that he is the most kind and soft and incredible person. Like he, he, he's, he my dad grew up, he's in a family of five, he's got five siblings, like, brothers he, and they weren't very wealthy at all they were in an area of nothing called Snenton and uh, it was kind of a rough upbringing the stories they tell and he's this he's an he's a he's a gentleman my dad is and he's so funny and he he made me and my brother I think the the people that we are and there's not an ounce of like toxic masculinity within my father and if I said any of this to him he wouldn't have any idea what I'm talking about but yeah I'm so grateful that I I got that one that I got him because that's that's really nice it was a bit gay wasn't it (laughs) (laughs) oh my god thank you so much even I get a little bit teary at these yeah they're good aren't they I yeah. should say that to my dad. You should. And do you know what he'd say? He'd go, all right. <laughs> oh, oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. And he'd give me a little pat on the shoulder. Okay. Uh, all right. You're hungry. That's oh, what he'd say. I love, I love any parent that bookends an emotional conversation with, are you hungry? Yeah. Have you eaten? That's why. Yeah. Are you hungry? Are you warm enough? Sarah Keyworth, thank you so much thank for, you for coming having- to Daddy. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Daddy. (laughs) That was Sarah Keyworth on Come to Daddy. Sarah, if the Come to Daddy listeners want to hear more of you, see more of you, find more of you, where can they do that? Uh, Social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm on uh, Twitter as Sarah K Comedy and Instagram is like Sarah underscore Keyworth or something like that. Oh, it's very uniform. Um, and I'm on tour at the moment, so I've got lots of live dates. I'm doing a big show at the Bloomsbury Theatre in London on March the 19th, which is a Sunday. Um, I have a podcast. Uh, it's called Thank Fuck for That with my friend and comedian Mickey Overman, which we'd love to have you on if you if you want to come along. I'm in. Um, 
Uh, it's about uh, near death experiences and sliding doors moments. I have a couple of stories for yes. you. Yes. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to listen to that, we release a new episode every Tuesday. Um, but th- yeah, that's that. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. That was Sarah Keyworth. This has been Come to Daddy. And I have been, unfortunately, Reuben Kay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>